So today we're continuing in 1 Corinthians, and we've been in, we've been in this uh, like smaller section of 1 Corinthians the last couple of weeks, and uh, the next pretty couple of chapters where Paul has started to turn the Corinthians' attention inward into how do we relate to one another in the church? What does it look like to, to be a church together? And so we saw what does it look like? So, so you know, he's been answering questions about what about idols? What about other gods? And what about our culture around us? And what about sin? And, and what about um, like relationships? Uh, how, do we, how do we relate to the world? What about the gospel? And he'll, go, he'll come back to the gospel in a couple of chapters. And, um, but, but in these few chapters, like 11, 12, 13, and 14, he's helping us understand how do we relate to one another? What does it look like when we gather? Like last week, what does it look like when we come together to gather around the Lord's table just to eat a meal together? How has, how has the gospel of Jesus broken down uh, distinctions that our culture holds up, like income, like status, like wealth or background, like which family you've come from? And Paul kind of systematically pulls out all of those threads to show us, no, you are sons and daughters of the king. Your brother, Jesus, big brother, is the king of all kings. It says when, when you gather together, you've got to wait for one another because we are, in a sense, beholden to one another. We'll look at this next week. We're actually, we're like a part of one another. Who is this, this metaphor of the body? He says, you are the body, individually members of one another. We can't say we don't belong to one another. And today, he's going to help us understand what does it look like for us to grow in and operate in the power of the Holy Spirit among us. So again, specifically the context is either when we gather or, or how we work together as a family as a body, as brothers and sisters, as people who belong to Jesus, as, as equals in the kingdom of heaven, as people who have ontological, uh, a, a unity of ontological worth, like at our, at our deepest core, we don't have people who are worth more than others, although our, our culture looks at people like that. Still, here we are 2,000 years later, and Paul could write this very thing to us today, saying, hey, remember how you view other people as lesser and greater? Well, like uh, Jesus' brother James says, you know, when you get together and, you know, you want to sit with your mates or sit with the important people and you kind of shun the unimportant people? He says, we don't do that anymore. We don't view each other that way anymore. We see each other. We, have, we gain the mind of Christ and view each other like that. And so today he's going to help us understand how do we do that when it comes to, again, the Holy Spirit. And, and, and one more thing before we get into the scripture. Remember again our context in Corinth where they are a culture that highly values knowledge, highly values status and prestige, very similar to us in our culture today where they would go and collect influences or sophists People, rhetoricians who could tell them this is how I should live. And, and the closer you could be to one of these very important people, these influencers, these learned people, uh, the, the more your social standing would increase. And the better followers they had, the higher their prestige and standing would be. And so you want to be with the in crowd, shun the out crowd, put your giftedness on display to increase your social standing and prestige, project to the world an image of how you'd want to be seen, hide away your failures, your brokenness, your sinfulness. There's a context into which Paul is writing these words. So let's pick it up, 1 Corinthians 12. It says, now, we've spoken about how you're a family. We've spoken about how you belong to one another. You're beholden to one another. And he says, now, concerning spiritual gifts, Brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware or ignorant, your translation might say. You know that when you were pagans, you used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know 
that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. Different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the message of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the, by the one Spirit, to another the performing of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between the Spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. One of the same Spirit is active in all these, distributing to each person as he wills. So this, is a, this has been, in certain times, a fairly contentious, maybe even controversial passage. There are people who, <clears throat> in our day today, will look at this passage and say, well, see these kinds of spiritual gifts? Uh, these, these should be normative in, in every Christian's life. Some will look at this list and say, well, there are individual people that might have like a mantle or a particular one of these gifts on their lives. And you even see, like I see on Facebook, people say, well, uh, my name is Prophet this or uh, Pastor that, even though Pastor's not here. They might say, I'm Evangelist this person, where they kind of claim this title of their giftedness and plonk it at the front of their name. Other people look at this passage and say, Oh, these were gifts in the first century in the early church that were expressed in the early church, but we don't see those anymore. Others would say, well, these are gifts we see in the apostolic ministry for the establishment of the church and for the authorship of the scriptures. But once we had the scriptures, now those kinds of gifts cease. Or they'll look at this list and they say, well, some of these gifts continue some of these gifts, like the sign gifts, have ceased. And so there is a wide range of views on spiritual gifts generally and on this passage specifically. So I find it interesting that Paul starts his thought with, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware. We don't want to be ignorant. We don't want to be unaware about the work of the Holy Spirit. Most of us, I could say all, but you know, it's hard to say all. Uh, every Christian believes the Holy Spirit is active today. Every Christian believes the Spirit is at work changing hearts and minds, drawing people to the Father because of the gospel. And others disagree on how is the Spirit at work in us. Most, or probably all, but again, most Christians would agree, Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. Is it working us, sanctifying us, meaning making us more into the likeness of Jesus in our set-apartness? But what about these spiritual gifts? So let's, let's get into them. The first thing is, like we see Paul right here, we do not want to be ignorant we don't want to do what the Corinthians were obviously doing, which was taking their experience. This is what we are experiencing. And we're just going to, because they didn't have the Scriptures in the totality like we do. They had the Old Testament Scriptures. They didn't have the New Testament Scriptures because this letter was written to them, you know, after they asked the questions about it. Um, they were going largely on, well, here's what our culture does. Here's what we're experiencing. The Spirit seems to be at work in these ways. Therefore, we're going to run ahead in those ways. And because our culture values the spectacular, because our culture values the rhetorician, then we have adopted in the church the cultural values. And therefore, we're going to just layer over the values of a culture into the spiritual world. But we don't want is for our experience to dictate our theology. We want to know what is true. We want to know what's from God. We want to know how God has made things in the world. And so the Word of God is what dictates our theology. So if you've had a spiritual experience in the past, we want to bring those experiences and submit them to Scripture to see how should we think about those experiences. 
If you have, if you want to know how should I exercise a spiritual gift or the way that the Spirit seems to have either quickened a natural gift or given me something supernatural that, that, that isn't just in the natural. If we want to know how do we do this, how do we exercise it, and we want to do it alongside and certainly subject to Scripture. We say, is this something that's been commanded in Scripture? Are there directions in Scripture? Has God already told us how we should do this? Which is why you get some, like uh, one of these gifts was speaking in tongues, for example. And I know for sure, in fact, I've visited churches in the past where um, they will have a gathering like this and people will speak in tongues and it'll be encouraged from the front, hey, everyone, let's speak in tongues. And then in a couple of chapters time, you'll see Paul actually writes, when it comes to speaking in tongues in a gathering, God is a God of order, not of disorder. And so he instructs us how we are to use gifts. So you might say, well, it was awesome and everyone was speaking in tongues. But we'd say, actually, was that awesome? Because we seem to be in direct disobedience to what God has already instructed us to do. So again, if you want to know how do you exercise a spiritual gift, we want to do it in line with Scripture, not just in a way that seems to work or seems good to us or has worked in the past. If you're on the other end of the spectrum and you've not experienced much or any spiritual gifts or supernatural activity, we also don't want our experience to dictate our theology. So whether you've experienced a lot of kind of what you call supernatural activity or, or nothing that you would class as supernatural activity, what we don't want to do is take our experiences and elevate them above Scripture. But rather, whichever end of that spectrum you're on, we want to submit our experiences to Scripture and say, how, how should I know how to think about spiritual gifts or the Spirit at work? I want to find it in Scripture, see what it says, and then apply that in my life. Does that make sense? So we do not want to be ignorant. We don't want to just go away from the Scripture and go, well, this is what I see happening, therefore I'm just going to keep doing that. Again, or whatever end of the spectrum you're on. We don't want to do that. We want to come to Scripture, submit our experience to Scripture, and see how would God have us think about this? What, what would God have us actually pursue, perhaps, when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit? What would he have us not do and not pursue and avoid when it comes to our thinking and approach to the Holy Spirit? He says, you used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols. He says, you've long been pursuing the spectacular. There's a warning for us, even in our day, is that we tend to see the spectacular, like the very beautiful, or the very gifted, or the very wealthy, or the super spiritual. And we say there's something special about that that, that, that is attractive to us in some sense. And so we gravitate towards the spectacular. And I put it to you, Paul is warning us, and, and I'm trying to echo his warning. If we only look for the spirit of work in the spectacular, we will miss the preponderance of his work, like the majority of his work in what seems very mundane to us but is spectacular when we view things from a heavenly perspective. He's speaking to some of their experiences. He's saying, man, that person who seems spectacular and very spiritual, but is talking down Jesus, says you can't say, you can't curse Jesus and have the Holy Spirit. It says, what appears to be amazing and spiritual and spectacular, he's trying to put it in its right place. He's trying to help us order our thinking. Submitting to Scripture, not being, not being ignorant, and trying to get our eyes away from being impressed by the flashy and the spectacular. He's saying no one can, no matter how amazing they look, they can't curse Jesus and be from God. Can't, can't talk down Jesus and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, on the other end, no one can even say with faith that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. That is a spiritual act empowered by the Holy Spirit, the only, the only one who can say Jesus is Lord by faith is one who does it in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Again, I'm trying to help you open your eyes to the ordinary miraculous. But we view these things way out of whack. We look at the spectacular and go, wow, that's amazing. And we see someone who professes faith in Jesus and we're like, that's great. But our, but our scales are way out of whack. He doesn't mean no one can verbally say those three words. He's saying, you know, with, with faith. No one can say it as a true statement. Apart from the Holy Spirit. And again, he's trying to remind them about their unity in Jesus, their unity in the Holy Spirit. It says there are different gifts, but it's the same Spirit. Different ways to serve. He his emphasis when it comes to the spiritual gifts. But the same Lord. Various activities, like it looks different. There's different things, some spectacular, some seemingly mundane, uh, some in public, some in private, some in front of many people, some in behind closed doors. It says, but it's the same God working them in each person. So he's prefaced this with chapter 10 and 11 by saying, remember, remember we are, uni- we are unified. Remember we're one in Jesus. Remember we're beholden to one another. And he'll continue talking about this for the next couple of chapters. But then, and then when he comes to Jesus, to our spiritual gifts, he's saying, we are unified, but not everyone does the exact same thing. If everybody only had and exercised one spiritual gift, it'd be a very lopsided church and community. If we only had preachers, it would be a very, it would not be a fun place to be. If we only had people who could distinguish between spirits, that could be really amazing. But then who would help us understand the scriptures? If we had everybody only had the singular gift of healing, that would actually be amazing on the one hand. And then how would we know how to use that gift? Paul's trying to help us understand, man, we belong to one another. We need one another. And there are various gifts, various activities, but it's the same Holy Spirit. And so when we look at different people exercising their gift in different ways and different gifts, he's trying to say, we don't want to look at one and be impressed and look at another and be unimpressed. That's, that's the ignorant way of thinking. But rather, we see the Spirit at work through the various activities, and we give God the glory for it all. So Paul's doubling down on the unity he implored us to pursue last chapter. Verse 7, he says, a manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person. So this word manifestation or you know, manifesting, um, you may not know what that means or you might have only heard it. Uh, you know, it's spoken about in really kind of freaky kind of senses. Uh, but this word really just means able to be perceived, able to be understood by, by our minds, through our senses. That's what manifest means. So it's the Holy Spirit doing a work through his people that can be observed by us. That's what this means. That's how he chooses to act by and through these spiritual gifts. And he finishes that sentence with, for the common good. So a manifestation of the Spirit. What are the spiritual gifts? It's a manifestation of the Spirit. It's the Spirit doing tangible or evidenced works among us in each person for the common good. And then he goes on and names some of the examples, which we'll get to. And he finishes the thought with verse 11. One and the same Spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as he wills. So again, unity, unity, Equal brothers and sisters among us, the Spirit, as the Spirit chooses, gives gifts to everybody who belongs to Jesus, everybody filled with the Spirit, that's everyone who belongs to Jesus, so that those gifts can be given for the common good. So here's the deal. Often when I hear people talk about spiritual gifts, they think about them as, well, the Spirit has given me a gift. And so I am the recipient of that gift. He's given me a gift. But I think what Paul's trying to say is actually the Spirit gives gifts to everybody to then give those gifts to others 
for the common good. He explicitly says it is for the common good. It's not for me to say, well, I've been gifted in this, I've received this gift, and now I am going to open this gift and I'm going to use this gift for my building up so that I can grow in prestige or status or wealth or whatever it is that you're pursuing. That's not what spiritual gifts are. That's not what spiritual gifts are for. Last week, Paul's rooting out division based on income or social status. And this chapter is rooting out division in the church based on their giftedness, based on their service. And in particular, here he names the more public or sign gifts. There are a few other places or a few other churches that he writes to where he gives similar kinds of lists of spiritual gifts, but they're different kinds of gifts. So here he has nine, I think, of these gifts. Uh, there's about maybe 19 or 20 specifically named throughout the New Testament, throughout Paul's writings. But I don't think he's trying to be exhaustive in this either. I think he's just giving some examples. And in Corinth, he's giving some examples which I think are being used to make dis- distinctions between people. And he's trying to root that out, saying, no, 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 no. God has given you these gifts graciously, wonderfully, not for you, but for you to use. So the Spirit can be manifest, the Spirit can be evidenced, the Spirit can be seen at work through you in the administration of those gifts. You may be able to tell in the way I'm preaching, I believe these the gifts are for today. I believe that the Spirit is still at work in us. He, he is wanting to be made manifest among us. He wants to be seen and known among us. Like I said, when we get to chapter 13, that, again, that famous wedding chapter, where we say, remember, love, love is the chief way the Spirit is made manifest among us. Love. What, what are the fruit of the Spirit rest of the church in Galatia? It says, how do you know the Spirit's at work among you? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. It says that's how you know the Spirit's at work among you. When the Spirit is made manifest in love and joy and peace. So often people look at these spectacular gifts and say, yes. And Paul even says, eagerly desire, eagerly pursue gifts like prophecy. Eagerly pursue, he calls them even the greater gifts. And so people look at that and go, well, I want to eagerly pursue prophecy, like the prophetic, the spectacular. But how does Paul help us understand if the Spirit's at work or if there's love, and if there's joy and peace and patience and kindness and self-control. The Spirit, verse 11, distributes to each person as he wills so we can ask God to help us or to, or to work in us in particular ways. The Spirit is the one who decides. God is sovereignly assigning and distributing gifts. I don't, I'm not, of the camp that believes that you know, someone can be a healer or a prophet necessarily, uh, but that the Spirit can choose any of us to work in any of these ways. But I also do, I am in the camp that believes that uh, God answers prayer and when we are obedient to Scripture and eagerly pursuing something, that the God, it doesn't interfere with God's sovereignty at all. But in His sovereignty, He loves to answer prayer. He, He loves to go where he's wanted. See, Paul writes to the Romans. He says, man, I I can't wait to come and see you. I'm I'm really keen to come and see you. Romans 1.11 says, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So he's not coming to, to give a spiritual gift for them to have a gift. The Spirit is the one who gives the spiritual gifts for us to give to others. He's saying, I want to come and give you the gift that I've been given. I want to come and encourage you for your building up, for the common good, so that your faith and my faith might grow, so that our trust in Jesus might grow, so that our seeing Him at work in our lives might grow, so that our allegiance to King Jesus might grow and deepen. So again, not ours to receive, it's ours to give in order to build up, strengthen the faith of brothers and sisters in ourselves. So what makes it a spiritual gift? 
again, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, in, in verse 7 here, it's gifts given by the Holy Spirit, a product of faith, powered by the Spirit for the building up or strengthening of faith in another. That's what a spiritual gift is. So I mean, the Spirit appoints so that his people can use it to put him on display. Like for, it's for the glory of God and for the building up of each other. That's what a spiritual gift is. So it's from faith, for faith, for the glory of God, so we can see how amazing God is. And again, not so that we just look at the spectacular stuff and go, wow, isn't that out of the ordinary and spectacular? But that, so that in every aspect and element of the Spirit at work among us, we might go, wow, isn't God phenomenal? Not just for us, but so that people could even look in us. So, so that when, like Jesus says in Matthew 5, you know, do your works in front of others so that they might see your good works and then give glory to your Father in heaven so that when they're looking in at us, God would see the glory. That the work of God would be manifest or tangible among us so people on the outside looking in would give God glory. Or John 13, 34, 35, where Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just like I've loved you, you are to love one another. And by your love, all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So that love, that the, the Holy Spirit at work in us, in the love that we have for one another, the same kind of love that Jesus has for us, people would look in on our love, on the Spirit at work and say, they belong to Jesus. Look at their love. So they are a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. They are a visible or audible or tangible or in some way noticeable work of the Holy Spirit among us. They display his presence through the ministries of God's people. So again, it's us serving one another with with what God has given us. So it's receiving These gifts, not opening, but then giving them to others for that figurative opening. They are the spirit wanting to work among us to build up, build us up and build up the faith of our brothers and sisters. Again, that's why Paul writes to the Thessalonians, uh, chapter 5, and he says, don't quench the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the work of the Holy Spirit. And this quenching can happen again at all along this spectrum from denying that he works at all so we don't pursue seeing him at work all the way through to just, again, focusing on those more spectacular things but neglecting God at work in amazing, phenomenal, miraculous but seemingly mundane ways. Just don't despise the spirit working in you. Again, in chapter 14, we say earnestly desire that the Spirit would work in you and through you. And so in Thessalonians again, he says, no, no, don't despise the work of the Spirit. Don't despise spiritual gifts. He says, judge them. He says, when you see people working and it seems to be the Holy Spirit at work, bring them back to Scripture to see if, in fact, this is God at work. Is this in accordance with God's will? Is this in accordance with what He's already revealed? Is this in accordance with the order that he's established and commanded. That's what Paul says for us to do. He says, don't despise the work of the Holy Spirit. We shouldn't be sceptical of the work of the Holy Spirit. We do need to judge, ascertain, is this actually the Holy Spirit? Is this this legitimate outworking of the Spirit? Just line up with what we know about him, what has already been revealed in him. So what are these gifts? Let's have a look. It says, To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit, to another a message of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. Again, hear him trying to say, you know, this seems, this seems amazing and spectacular. But remember, same Spirit. We, we don't, this isn't me being amazing. This isn't you being amazing. This isn't this other guy or, or girl being amazing. This is the Holy Spirit tangibly at work among us. To another faith by the same Spirit, gifts and healing by the one Spirit, performing of miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between the Spirits, different kind of tongues, interpretation of tongues. So again, 
just a few of the gifts. I don't think this is Paul saying, here's the exhaustive list. All of you have got one of these. I don't, he's not saying that. I'm not, I don't think he's also saying, just pick one of these and go for it, the one you like the most. I don't think he's saying that either. He's saying, here are some of the ways that the Holy Spirit is at work among you. And he's picking some of the ones maybe that they were claiming for themselves, saying, well, I'm smart. That's why I know stuff. Or I'm really, I live a very good life. That's why I'm receiving this kind of work or this kind of outcome of my life. I think God, uh, Paul is trying to say, God is trying to say to us through Paul and by his spirit today, a God is at work in us. And he wants to work through us in ways that build up one another, in ways that put his glory on display so that we would glorify him and worship him. It's a message of wisdom. We need people who are gifted with wisdom. So that when we don't know what to do, or we've got two really good options, it's not a, <clears throat> it's not a lack of knowledge. We, we, th- these are great options. God, which one should we pursue? That we would have people who have the Holy Spirit working through them to help us understand which out of seemingly good options is the one that God would have us take. A message of knowledge. When we don't know, when we're lacking the knowledge that God might speak to us in ways that we couldn't otherwise know. Faith, that we all have, we've all been gifted faith. And there are some who seem to have more faith, more trust in God, a greater dependency on Him. And we need those people as well because they're the ones who go out and do things that we don't think we can do. Healing, again, uh, I think that God is at work. We, we can all and should all ask for healing. God, God's even helped us, instructed us in other parts of scriptures. Um, again, uh, in New Testament where he says, Man, if, if any of you are sick, call on the elders, get them around, anoint you with oil. Ask God to heal. Again, I think that's an example. Uh, and, and in obedience, we've done that. Elders have done that many times. And sometimes God has healed that person. So in obedience, we need to do this, but that doesn't prevent everyone from asking and it also doesn't mean that the Spirit will work specifically through some people in this particular way. Performing miracles, I think it's just a kind of a catch-all category for things that we cannot expect, that we couldn't do just in the natural. That o- Things that only God can do, He chooses to do. Prophecy, which is not just like foretelling something that will happen in the future, but is any kind of forth telling of truth. And so in the Old Testament, you have prophets, some of them who would say, this is what's going to happen unless you do this or because you've done that, this is what's going to happen. So a foretelling of the future. And those prophets, if you're going through the the Bible in a year uh, with the church at the moment, you'll have heard in the last week some real prophets from God like Jeremiah saying, God's coming and it's not good news. And some false prophets at the same time as Jeremiah saying, no, no, don't listen to Jeremiah. This is only a temporary, like it's going to last a couple of months or a couple of years and then everything's going to go back to normal. And uh, Jeremiah comes in and says, no, actually, that's, you're a false, you're a false prophet. Uh, and this is what God says to you today. So a foretelling, uh, sorry, a foretelling of, of what's going to happen, of what is presently happening or a reality. A spiritual reality. I think every time we open up the scriptures, like what I'm doing right now, what I'm doing right now is in part prophetic. I think how we live our lives, again, when the world is looking in and seeing our good works, or the world is looking in and seeing our love we have for one another, we are living in a prophetic way. We are making a claim or we are presenting a truth about the world and about God. Distinguishing between the spirits. So again, something seems supernatural or something seems to be a work that the Holy Spirit is moving in some as he wills to be able to distinguish, oh, this is, this is the Holy Spirit at work. This is, this is God at work. Or this is a counterfeit spirit that is trying to do the same works as a spirit, but it's not from God. 
And number eight here, the ability to speak in other languages. So I don't know a language, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, I could speak another language. And then understanding or interpretation of those languages. So again, I don't speak in another language. I hear someone speaking in a language that I don't know, but the Spirit helps me to understand that I can translate that language. Or someone's speaking to me in a language I don't know, but the Holy Spirit gives me the ability to understand that, that uh, language. I've heard first-hand accounts of every single one of these spiritual gifts at work in, in my lifetime, in our day. So again, I, I don't say, well, because I've heard them, because I've experienced some of these, that I elevate that above Scripture. No, in every way, we bring those under Scripture and say, how should I think about what I've experienced? But also, we should then look at this and go, because Scripture says it, how then should I live? So if I haven't experienced these things before, but the Scripture tells me that the Spirit wants to do this work, maybe I need to repent of not eagerly pursuing the gifts and then say, God, how would you work in my life and pursue the spiritual gifts? If I've seen the, uh, seen the supernatural, but I haven't, conform, I haven't um, submitted my experience to Scripture before, maybe again I need to repent and say, oh, maybe I have led into excess, into things that haven't brought God glory, or ways that point to me and not to Him. I need to repent of that and again, bring my experience under the Scriptures, see how God would have me act, and then go and do likewise. Be not just hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. So I've got five questions for us today. It's actually more than five. There's some like sub-questions, but five things to ask yourself, and like we've been doing in this series, to ask people who speak into your life as well, people who know you. Ask this, how is the Spirit in my, at work in my life now? How is the Spirit at work? If you want to you know, how can I be not just a hearer but a doer of what we've just read? How's the Spirit working me now? How is He already pointing to the glory of God in my life? How have I disregarded the seemingly ordinary but miraculous work of the Holy Spirit in my life? How have I seen the Spirit at work but I haven't acknowledged that it was Him? When I see love and joy, peace, and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control when I've prayed for someone and God has done a work in their life or when I've said something to someone which I don't know why those particular words but they seem to have built their faith. Has God already a work in my life? Secondly, how am I utilising my natural, so just the the natural way that God has, has made me the spiritually quickened, natural, and also the spiritual gifts he's given. Am I using these for me only? Am I primarily using these for me and for building me up or for the common good, for the building up of my brothers and my sisters? Thirdly, or have I avoided and maybe even despised the Holy Spirit's work? I think for me, uh, over the last, let's say, my adult life, uh, I have gone for, like, oscillated from eagerly pursuing the greater gifts to almost even neglecting them and just assuming or, or presuming on the Spirit's work in my life. And I look at some of the excesses, especially of um, some like uber Pentecostal churches from like America and uh, and Africa in particular, those two kind of places. And I say, man, they are, this is not the Holy Spirit at work. There's something counterfeit. I don't want anything to do with that. But the, the proper, the right response is not to run away from these excesses and swing the pendulum to the other end of the extreme, but rather to come and conform her life to Scripture. So what does the Bible say? Oh, that, it's not that. But it's also not that. So we don't just swing the pendulum away from the foolishness, from the sinful, and I would say even maybe demonic, but rather we pursue 
Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We don't despise and avoid the work of the Holy Spirit because some people claim the Holy Spirit and don't and aren't working in the power of the Holy Spirit. Or claim the Holy Spirit and aren't obedient to Scripture. Fourthly, <clears throat> am I looking for the spectacular over and above the seemingly mundane but miraculous good? I would love to see the spectacular. But I love seeing this, or again, mundane is the wrong word. It's, it's miraculous ordinary. Where people are bearing one another's burdens. That is, that is spectacular, actually. Where people are providing for one another with food, with shelter, with their lives, with their emotional support and capacity. These things are, this is the Holy Spirit at work among us. These are, these are amazing, wonderful, miraculous things. And fifth, and like Paul, by no means is this exhaustive, but just more homework for us this week. What is the measure of my eagerness to see the Spirit work to build up my faith in others? Am I, am I so busy and consumed? Do I, have, do I lack margin in my life with just working and hobbies and family and friends? Have I actually filled my life so much with, with just my stuff, there's actually no room for the Holy Spirit to move. Even as we're going through this sermon or going through this, um, this passage today, you might be going, I don't have time for this. I, can't, I have no extra capacity for what we're talking about here. If God started doing this, it would radically change my life. But I like my life. So I'd say this might actually be more like under category three, despising the work of the Holy Spirit, but it's boxing him out of our life. So for us, what is the measure of my eagerness to see the Spirit at work? And remember, we are, we're actually commanded in Scripture to eagerly pursue these gifts, to eagerly pursue a manifestation. Remember, manifestation is not, let me tell you, it's not people flopping around on the floor. It is seeing the Spirit at work in our lives. That's what manifestation means. It's this tangible evidence of the Spirit at work in these ways. Again, not abstract of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. It's all of those. And like we see, we get to chapter 13. It is especially love. And then it's also the Spirit at work building up each other and building up our faith. So let's ask these questions this week. How's the Spirit working me now? What's he already doing? Am I actually already exercising spiritual gifts, but I haven't, I haven't noticed or I haven't acknowledged this has got to work among me, uh, in me and among us? Am I utilizing these gifts that God's given me just for me or for building up the body? Have I been avoiding the Spirit's work? Have I been just looking for the spectacular and not trying to see this ordinary miraculous? And fifth, what's the... What's the measure of my eagerness? Am I eager to see the Spirit at work? My, my hope is we would be a people marked by our eagerness. Not that we're running out ahead of what God is doing. Not certainly that we'd be running away from the Scriptures. As, as I see, I have, I have, I mean, real personal, long-time friends who have in their eagerness to see the Spirit of work, they have deviated away from Scripture. And I think away from the Holy Spirit in there, what was started as an eagerness to see the Spirit of work has become an eagerness for the spectacular, which is not, in some cases, the Spirit of work at all. But for me, I hope we would all be eager. We'd all be eager to be a people marked by love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control marked by people who are using what God has given us for each other, for the building up of the saints, to, to, for, for your faith and for mine to be increased, for your trust in Jesus and mine 
to be made much, much more robust and ultimately so that God would be glorified among us. Let's pray. Father, everything I just said, that's my request for you. We'd be a, we'd be a in fact, we are. We are a spirit-filled people. And I'm, I'm so thankful for the ways that the spirit is at work among us already. We see this all the time. And, and so I praise you today for the way you're already among us. We are sorry for those times together and individually where we've not pursued your spirit at work among us or when we've even despised your spirit's work. We've boxed out any, any margin at all, and not even margin, but, but the centering of your Holy Spirit's work in our lives. We're sorry. Please help us see things from your perspective, from a heavenly point of view. Please use us in any, any way you see fit. Help us, Father, to uh, pursue you first. So when we lack wisdom, we pursue you and, and a word from your spirit. When we lack knowledge, we pursue you. When we need healing, we would pursue you. We'd go to you first. When we need to know between spirits, we'd go to you first. Father, in every way that we would seek your spirit at work among us. Thank you for working among us. Thank you for bringing us into your kingdom, into your family, into unity and union with Jesus. And thank you that you're still at work in us and through us by your spirit. Help us to bring you glory in every way. In Jesus' name, amen.